So we talked about supervised learning and the uh, basic uh, setup is that you get a set of labeled samples, right? Xi inputs, Yi's outputs, and you want to learn this mapping function from Xi's to Yi's. But um, in many problems, you do not have labeled data and often you don't have a lot of labeled data. In fact, one of the largest problems in machine learning became how, where do you get high quality labeled data from? And this is uh, extremely hard uh, with techniques like, with approaches like deep learning that requires a lot, a lot, a lot of labeled samples. Uh, just to give you the scale, um, I think at, uh, at Google, we worked with a data set of labeled images that had, anyone want to guess? 900 million labeled images, okay? Uh, that's a that's a large number. Of course, you need to own a search engine uh, to get. All, and of course, not all of them were sent to human raiders. But you uh, use the power of crowd. Every time you use, uh, let's say, Google Image Search, and you search for something and you click, this gives some feedback about that label. So you can collect a lot of label data in some clever ways that are not extremely expensive, just very expensive. So the the problem is that then what you do when you, you're not Google, right? What you do with most problems? Uh, how do you get uh, labeled data from? So m maybe this is a, a good time to make this separation between unsupervised and super. Do, do, do you guys have a course with, in unsupervised learning? Yes. Yeah. So you know what unsupervised learning is. You have just X's. You don't have Y's. Uh, you know what supervised learning is. You have Y's. And recently, uh, people discovered um, ways that are very efficient, very successful to do unsupervised learning using supervised techniques. So you do supervised learning with unlabeled data. And the idea is the same idea as why you use unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, your goal is to find some good representation of the data. And this is useful for data analysis. Maybe you want to do PCA or clustering some to visualization to understand your data. This is one reason why you would use unsupervised learning. The other reason to use unsupervised learning, you say, well, I'm going to use a good representation of the data. I'm going to throw all the things that are not important. And then once I have a good representation, perhaps then I can learn more easily with just a few samples. Right? And by the way, this is also something that your perception system does. Um, for example, if you did not hear, there are some, some languages, like Asian languages, if you did not, were not exposed to some sounds, uh, then you lose your ability to make some discriminations. So you will no longer be able to speak fluently Thai or something like that, right? Or even, uh, even French. Anyone here speaks French? Oh, yeah. There are like four different uh, accents circumflexes, accents graves, right? Uh, and if you were never, if, if you didn't, were not exposed to these, I don't think anyone can uh, can make you know discriminate the fine distinctions of a and a, right? It just sounds the same to us because we threw away some of the part, or some of the aspects of the sound waves that are not useful for us, right? So we are doing some unsupervised learning, focusing on the representation that is useful for us. So I, I want to tell you about uh, this approach called self-supervised learning. Again, you use unlabeled data. But the trick is that instead of using clustering or PCA or something, you try to use the data itself and, and invent kind of supervised problems using your data. So I'm gonna, this is going to be more of a fun uh, lecture than a technical one. I think the last one was harsh. Um, OK, sorry. Uh, at some point, he, he called it unsupervised, but that was really confusing to people. It is unsupervised, but it, use, it is using supervised techniques for unlabeled data. So he replaced it and called it self-supervised learning. So, so Jan has this uh, cake metaphor that became very popular. So he kind of describes different learning setups. And he says, you know, one of the, the problems that you're really interested in is reinforcement learning, pure reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you're taking actions, you make decisions, you take action, and after a long series of operations, you get, you get feedback. 
Uh, for example, you know, you, you keep studying through elementary school and high school and university, and at some point you get reward. I don't know, you have a good career or you have some interesting uh, job, right? And you only get these feedback bits pretty late in life, right? Um, all these decisions that you made throughout life, you don't get, uh, usually you don't really get immediate um, benefits, um, unless you like learning, which is great. So the number of bits you get per sample is actually very, very, very small, right? You get a lot of samples, but only very few bits. Then there's uh, supervised learning. Uh, so, so, so Jan, I mean, pure reinforcement learning, he says, oh, this is like a cherry on the cake. You get very little supervision. Uh, supervised learning, as you get a sample, you get, the you get a label, you feedback. You get a sample, you get a feedback. You get, this is like the icing on the cake. But then you have self-supervised learning, which is the cake gen was, whatever. The, this is most of the data, most of the bits of data are actually come with no labels. Uh, and the, the, you have millions of bits per sample. I mean, if you, you look at an image, it has tons of bits, right? So can we use all these bits somehow? And this is the premise of unsupervised learning. Uh, can we learn something about the presentation with, even without having labels? And, and also, this makes a lot of sense because you know that uh, people and animal, right, uh, organism learn without labels, right? Uh, Children or animals, they learn how to walk, uh, to touch things, to see, um, to separate figure from background. They don't need someone giving them explicit labels uh, only, only later in life when they learn how to, to speak, maybe. Um, but of course, there are, you can define other labels. But as a, as a metaphor, it's clearly useful to learn without labels. So um, by the way, uh, right after Jan showed this, uh, Peter Abil, which is a, uh, a researcher in reinforcement learning, uh, showed this uh, cherry cake. Um, well, in reinforcement learning, you do repeated, you can repeat the uh, sampling, you repeat repeated play, so you have a lot of cherries. So this became kind of a you know nice interaction. But anyways, so I, I want to tell you about this approach of self-supervised learning, and um, the uh, key idea. Actually, you don't have to read that. The key idea is the following. You're given your data, you're going to distort it in some way, you're going to hurt it and you know, distract it in some way, and then you will try to predict the original pure sample of the data that you had. How can you do that? Well, if there, are st if there is structure in the data, if there are dependencies in the data, then you can predict the parts that you don't see. For example, if I ask you, uh, what's the color of the back of my shirt? You, you can probably do that, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't see that, but you can guess. I, I don't know what it is, but you can guess what it is. Because you understand something about the world, it's probably the same, I, I don't know, it's probably the same as the front, right? So this reflects the fact that you understand, you understand the data. You can make predictions about things that, that are not directly observed. And you can do that because you learned a model of the data, and maybe this representation can help you make predictions uh, in, in other tasks. So again, the idea is that you take your data, it does not have labels. You distort it or distract it or create uh, another task from your unlabeled data. You train using supervised techniques for that task. And hopefully, I mean, you, you hope that the representation that you learn for these made up task will help you in the task that you really care about. Okay, so you're training for one task, but hope that this would be useful later in the task that you really care. Okay, that's a trick. And I'm gonna tell you about uh, just a bit of the history and recent techniques that use this in, uh, in images, in video, and in text. That's the plan. And of course, feel free to ask questions. And, uh, okay, um, so the data provides the supervision. Okay. Uh, Quick recap of history. Um, so, you know, I told you about, uh, you know, uh, SVMs, they kind of killed neural networks, and then there was uh, all the 90s, and the 2000s, there were a lot of other techniques, um, more like online learning. And then in 2010, uh, Jeff Hinton and, um, and uh, Ras Salhatnikov uh, published a paper in Science, and they said, you know, 
we always had this problem with neural networks that it was hard to optimize. We didn't know how to initialize them. But now we have an idea. We are going to use unlabeled data to initialize our networks. And after we do that, we can do fine tuning. We can do supervised learning. But we are not just going to randomly initialize our networks. Uh, but we're going to use the unlabeled data as a pre-training pre step and only later train like a supervised in a supervised technique, as, as, you, as you know. So, um, and they had this uh, complex, relatively complex uh, approach called uh, restricted bolt machines. The idea is that you, let's say you show some uh, samples, uh, you cause the network to reconstruct them. I'm, I'm skipping all the details. And after you did that, there was a representation that was learned and you can then um, use it to, to train whatever task you have. And this is actually, I think, one of the things that started the, the, the interest of people in deep learning because suddenly there was, this was a science paper. But of course, two years later in 2012, um, when uh, Hinton showed that deep networks uh, kind of broke all the, the, the ImageNet challenge, people started to be really interested. I, in parallel, I think, I don't remember, oh, this is 2008. Um, Yoshua Bengio had this idea that was called denoising autoencoders. So let me describe to you in a second what autoencoders are. Did you study that in unsupervised learning? No? So imagine you have a vector of input, okay? And you transform it in some way to a compressed, to fewer numbers, a smaller dimension vector. And then you map it back to the original space. And what you want to do, you want to learn a projection and then a projection back such that you reconstruct the original. But of course, you cannot just have the identity because you're, you're, there's this bottleneck, the small number of, the, the, your, this intermediate description is limited, it's compressed. So you cannot be perfect, usually. But to do a good um, representation, you need kind of to capture the structures in the data. And, and Yoshua added, uh, Yoshua Benjo added another trick to this. What he said is, Instead of presenting the original date, uh, vector, he, they actually um, masked, so they killed some of the bits, right? They like uh, you know added noise to the original data, but they asked the system to recreate the not noised version. So I'm giving you something that has noise in it, uh, but I'm asking you to reconstruct <coughs> the data before the noise. Now, of course, you cannot do that. To do that, you need to learn something about the statistics of, of the data. So this was called denoising autoencoders. Um, this is not the best representation, but that, that's how they described it. Basically, you have your X, right? You, you add some noise, let's say you mask some of the bits, and then you want to map it to intermediate representation Y, and then map it to the high dimension representation. And you want, um, that output to be similar to original before you added noise to that. It's kind of weirdy, but the idea is, is simple. Um, so what I'm trying to say that these ideas that you um, use kind of unsupervised techniques to learn representations, they've been there for a long, long time, but they really took off last year uh, with the uh, when people show that this worked very well on, on text and in natural language processing. I'm gonna get to that uh, at the end. Um, okay, oh, by the way, maybe I shouldn't, uh, in 2012, uh, I, I told you that when Deep Network was introduced, the story was, oh, let's do unsupervised learning, it's gonna help us with the supervised task, and everyone was doing pre-training using the unlabeled data, but then at some point, people started to say, well, actually, I don't need that. I just have enough label data, and just people stopped doing this pre-training. <coughs> so it was kind of the, sto the pitch was, oh, we can do deep network uh, today because we, have, we do pre-training with unlabeled data, but then they discovered, oh, that's actually not useful. So they just did the supervised part. And this was, uh, I think, at AlexNet. Uh, they did data augmentation. They did a lot of tricks instead. OK. So I want to describe to you several ideas of how you do this uh, self-supervised learning uh, on images. Um, 
Here's, uh, this, I think this is one of the cutest examples. Um, so I'm showing you two patches. And the task is, from, from some image, and the task is to predict the spatial relationship between the two patches, right? So I'm not asking you what it is. Uh, it's easy for you. But I'm asking you what, how, where should that patch should be relative to that patch. Can you guess? Yeah, it's the, it's the left ear, right? I mean, the, it's left. Um, so the idea the, in the task is that you select one patch, then there are uh, po potential eight surrounding patches, and the classifier just need to guess one, one to eight, right? That would be the output. So you understand the task. And, and the, uh, what, what's that? No? OK. Uh, I thought you know that cat or something. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's a, yeah, <laughs> I've been giving this talk. It's the first time I noticed the snake. <laughs> you know the gorilla? Uh, have you seen the gorilla? Yeah, yeah that's the, my gorilla. Okay, so so once again, look, um, we're gonna train with this with this uh, weird task of patch relations. And we're going to learn a representation. And at the end, we, we don't care about that task. We just want to use the representation to do, let's say, object classification or image classification. So uh, here's another, just, just other examples because it's cute. Um, what is the relative position of these two? Yeah, uh, this is probably the top of the bus. And this is the left wheel or perhaps front wheel. You see, to solve this, you actually need to, to know things about buses or, or things, right? This, it's, not any, it's not just the um, you know, low-level spatial continuity. You really need to understand something about the structure of what you see about the data. Uh, same here. This is the top of the train. This is the <laughs> wheel. So yeah, you guess it. Um, so how do you do that specifically in practice? You didn't learn deep networks yet. So all these boxes are going to be just boxes. So think about them as very complicated functions that you learn their parameters somehow, OK? Um, and there's a, there's, there are ways to, to learn this parameter. Imagine that you just, so uh, what you do here, you present the two patches. You map them through these parameters. And the classifier takes them and need to decide, you know, the output is one out of eight, kind of a multi-class output. So once you finish training with this data, and, and once, once again, you don't need to have any labels for these uh, images, right? You don't need a uh, cat or snake or whatever it is. Um, but after you did that, you basically throw out the classifier and you just look at the output of this. So basically, you learn a new representation. Given an image, if you look at the output here, the output is going to be a vector. It's not just going to be a scalar, it's just a, a whole vector. So you learn a new representation for every image you can compute the new representation. And it turns out that. Um, now you can do several things. You can try to understand what was this representation. How does it look? So here's what they, they actually did something interesting. So you look at the input. Again, you, you present this image to the network and you compute this uh, representation. You have a feature vector. And now they repeat that for a lot of other patches, a lot of other images and patches in the data. And they look what other patches have a similar representation? OK, you, you understand me? Mm -hmm. Just nod if you do. What's the, what's the picking procedure, the whole image? Like um, so I think here, no, these are just the patches. So, so once again, they take a patch, they compute this representation, and now they, for all patches, they just pass them through this representation and have a vector for each patch. Yeah, but how do you choose the CNN? Um, so you, Put a patch here, you compute this function, and you get the output. This was after you trained the CNN on this auxiliary task. You trained the CNN on? So you train, OK, two phases. <coughs> Sorry. We are, and, and we are just in phase one. In phase one, we, try, we train this CNN to, to <coughs> classify where the output is one, one of eight. Yeah, here's the, oh, here's the training procedure. You take an image, you cut it to patches, you select randomly, well, you select the middle, you select randomly one of eight, 
you feed the two into the same network. These are put to the same networks. And wait, wait, wait. Huh? So you feed these two patches, and you ask the network, what do you think is the relative position? And then the network says three, and it says wrong, and fix your parameters. So the first part is supervised. This is super, yeah. No, wait, wait, wait. It's a supervised technique with unlabeled data. We don't have labels about the object, but we make up these labels, these one, one to eight, because we know them. We just created that. But it's supervised in terms of you giving the right answers about the patch. Yes, 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 exactly. So it's a supervised techniques about this made up task. OK? These were very good questions. Yes? And the label is the relative position to each other. Yeah, one of eight. More questions. It's a bit confusing because it's an unlabeled data, and you make up this task, and why would it help? But, but well, our labels is the place where like, there's a position of the, the. The label is one out of eight. Label one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have labeling, but it's a different label. Well, it's not. It's, it's a la I mean, you made up this task for that task, you have labels, but you don't necessarily have labels for what is this image about. Right? We don't need labels that this is a cat. <laughs> right? What's that? We're yeah, or. Yeah, yeah. Yes? But we can only do it for images with the cat with, in this position, like, like facing, I don't know, this direction or, uh, or not. You know, no, you can, you can do it on any image. Yeah. yeah. Then we have to do it for all the images, like flip, flip the, or maybe flip it left to right. I'm not sure. Are you suggesting I mean, other tasks? I mean, I mean, now we're learning that the, this ear is, uh, we know the relation. Yeah. So if we want to look at a cat that looks facing another way, it might not, maybe it's it might make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. I'm not saying it's going to do perfectly on this task. Yeah. Someone has to allocate a picture to put the blue bounded box on the Um. No, you randomly set, you, you just put patches randomly. Random, well, you know, in the center somewhere. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about there are some subtleties. No, just random, just put patches randomly. Yeah, yep. How do you make sure in such a case that you don't overfit the data? You might. Yeah, you should be careful. You should do, you know, cross-validation. There are a lot of things in supervised learning. It, yeah, you do the standard things. You do cross validation, you regularize your network, whatever. That, yeah, sure. Um, your end goal is not actually the, this uh, segmentation, but in fact the representation that is found from. Very right? good, exactly. So, how is this different from transfer learning? If you are using, if you are going to use this representation in, in some other task, is, is this different from transfer learning? Yes. So transfer learning, um, you know what, but, but let's keep that question. It's a very good question because there are other ways to learn representations. Um, but let's, let's finish this and remind me, you know, if I forget, remind me to, to talk about this. It's going to be an interesting comparison, but I want to finish co describing this first. Yes? If you have enough Ys, like for your actual task. Like yeah, you maybe you don't need that. Yeah, that's yeah sure. Different. Yeah, if you have tons of data, yeah, why would you bother with this weird task? Yeah, yes. Just, just so the, the original task, what, what is it? You want to find the, the position, or that's already the, the self-supervised part? So I'm going to show you in a minute that after we learn this representation, we can use it to initialize a network for image uh, categorization. Like for telling cats from dogs from camels. So now if I have like 10 pictures and I find out them to 8 patches, so eventually I'm going to have data with 80, uh, 80 samples. And well, you can, you can map. I mean, you can sample a lot of patches on all these images. You don't need just a single patch. You can, you can repeat that. Okay. Yeah. OK? Good. So. This was the kind of auxiliary task, like made-up tasks. Sometimes they're called pretext tasks, which is weird. Um, so after you did that, you have a representation, right? Given an, uh, you have a function. So given a new patch, you can 
compute the output of that CNN. So here's what they did. They computed this representation of all patches in the data. Okay? And now given, given a patch, they can look at all the other patches that have a similar representation. And if this learns something useful, then, um, I mean, let's see what it does. So for that patch, these are the nearest neighbors in feature space, in the representation <coughs> space. And this, is actually, this is actually pretty impressive, right? Um, given that, I don't know, quarter of a wheel, it does have wheels, right? They are, they are pretty, they are semantically similar. They're not, you know, notice the task was about the relative position, was not about, in a way, the content. But still, it captures, it, it does capture semantic similarity. I'm not, this is probably a cat. These may not be cats. What, I mean, that one is, but I don't know what kind of mammal this is. But, but um, I hope a, a legal one. But, but it does capture this, right? The same part of the, of the, of the face, right? Uh, so I think this really captures the kind of the semantics of what this patch is, contain, is containing, right? Um, here's a more interesting comparison, even. So um, this was the input. This is what I showed you now. These are the representation from their model. And these are the representations if you look at a model that at the representation of one model was trained with, with real labels. So let me explain what this is. This is an AlexNet. This is just one architecture of, of a deep network that was trained with a large data set called ImageNet, where you have 1,000 images of a cat with the label cat. So you, you train on these million of images with, you know, image label, image label, you train, and the output representation you know, it, it, looks, it looks pretty similar, right? It captures about the same type of, <coughs> of structures. Now, but, but with one very important difference. That approach did not use any labels for the image object classification. And that one did have one million of these. Yes? Sorry, between similarity between what and what? Between patches of only the special uh, location. You split an image to patches, let's say bottom left, so yeah. there, there will be a wheel there and also a, a left leg of the chair, for example. Okay. So there was no similar neighborhood <coughs> that, uh, that uh, vector also? Y you mean you'd expect that patches from the same image would look similarly? That's my question, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess you're right, but you see they are not the nearest neighbors. Well, yeah, that's important. That's really important. That's a very good question. Look, this, w when they say neighbor, similar, it's not similar in pixel space. This it was not taking patches and comparing their pixels. It was comparing the learned representation. And, and this is important. Let me show you, for example, here. You see, these two are perceived as similar. But of course, if you'd compare the pixel, this one is red and this one is green. They are not going to be similar in pixel space. Uh, and, and similar here, you see all these backs of cars. This back of a bus, if you do pixel by pixel similarity, it's not going to be nearest neighbor to that guy's. So clustering would have been if we use the pixel by pixel similarity? C clustering at pixel space, if you just look at pixel space, you get one similarity. But here you got a different type of similarity that captures more of the semantics. So and, and by the way, uh, uh, sorry, um, if you just compare images pixel to pixel, that's a really bad measure of similarity. Because you know, if you just move a few pixels, imagine a zebra that you, you know, just move a bit, right? Uh, the similarity is not going to be high. Yes? But it looks like uh, legs are really bad defined, yeah? The what? Uh, legs, like where you show the bus. This one? Uh, uh, the tips on, on the bottom. One, two, three, four, four. This one, yeah. yeah. That that one's not great. Just one yeah. example, but yeah, but, uh, but uh, from the same uh, family. 
Also yeah, now the, um, yeah, some of these doesn't work well. Always. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, I don't remember. Uh, maybe it says that somewhere. Uh, I don't remember. The, the link is here uh, for details. Uh, Dirch and uh, Gupta. Uh, I would guess, um, oh, it's the, let's say an order of 100. An order. Yeah. Sorry? No. Yes. So we have two, two deep networks, ours and Alex's, right? that are both trained basically for a job that is not finding similarities. But actually, Alex Net tries to, to, to attach a label to the data, right? And ours tries to, to, to say the position. Why yeah. not just try to find, to, to create a network that finds similarities <coughs> for that? Good question. The point is that we want to use the, the, the in a way, what they're showing here is that you can train for object classification without the la classification labels. Because you get similar representation that you get if you train with labels. So let me skip just to this. The point is the, f the following. If you take this data, this is one data called Pascal VOC. It's a detection problem, not classification. So in detection, you need to both find a box of where an object is, you know, find where the cat is and what is in that box. So it's not exactly classification, but also detection. Um, so if you use a network that was pre-trained using ImageNet labels, you get some accuracy. If you get, if you use this approach, it does not has no labels, it's not using any labels you get something that's better than random. Well, it's not there yet, but it's, you know, it's half the way without using any labels. And so the cost of this, how much you pay mechanical turkers on this is zero, and this is, um, I think, about $2 million it was at the time. Several things uh, determining the computational cost. First is how complex this function is. Um, second, how much data, how, you know, how long do you need to train? It's a, I don't know exactly if this was taking more time. It's a very good point. It's possible it's much harder to train. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. I don't know the, we, we, I, I'm not sure they reported that, but it's a good point. Okay, more questions. Yes, uh, uh, there, w there was another question there? No, okay. Oh, I hear? No one, someone? Yes. So we don't know what what is the for instance we'll take uh, the, the, uh, the image we don't know which region is more interesting for us but so if for instance we take the size of some uh, random size of this representation for instance nine like nine nine, nine cubes <coughs> from the image we don't know which region is, is the most interesting right so we, we like it's not a vector we're getting some matrix if I understand right now so it's, 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 what it's are you asking the, about uh, for instance this cat we don't know this. This part is actually represents a cat. So we have to take a represent, uh, generate representation, divide all the pic all the pictures uh, to the same number of regions, for instance. No, no, no. The, the representation. Sorry. No, the representation. Sorry. The representation is just for a single patch. Yeah, but we have to take we have to take all the patches from each. Uh, from, from, from you you from don't have to. No. Because we don't know which patch represents. <coughs> The, the yeah, important yeah, information. Yes, yeah, some of the data is not going to be useful. Some of it is going to be useful, some is not. That's okay. But each patch, it's, uh, it's a vector. What, or it's like yeah, each, each patch is a vector. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, you can you view it as a matrix. Image, we take um, a random, random number of vectors. No, you take exactly two patches. You take one patch that you view as the center and then another patch that is randomly taken from one of eight positions. Yeah, so the question is how to understand what, you, what, what is the central patch? There's no central patch. You just randomly select a patch. It does not have to be central. Okay. Uh, for example, here, it does not have to be central. It could be on this side. In this one example, it is uh, seated on the center of the face of the cat, 
But this is just one example. It does not happen. Okay, does not have to be. Take on the left. Yes. You could take Where that patch and things on the right. Yeah, and then this would not be very useful. Okay. That's okay. You don't have to be extremely useful for every sample. Yes? Maybe related to this question. What was the main idea of the task, generally? Uh, or it was just, let's do this and no any main idea. Or it was done for anything. So uh, m maybe we take it offline. Uh, <laughs> Uh, There's a, I, it sounds a bit like a philosophical question. No, uh, no, no, no. So I, maybe I didn't understand. M maybe I didn't understand the... No, just to, I wanted to understand what, what, what exactly was, was done for. Maybe it was a, a next step, like, uh, where it was used, like, to... It, it cannot be so that my idea was just to identify patches and to... to, and to so so the, point is, the point is that we I invent here a, a made-up task that allows us to train and learn a representation. And then at a later point, um, you can use that representation in a, in a task that you really care about. Like, um, in this case, this was detection. So the, the point is that by doing, if you don't do any pre-training, you get 45%. If you pre-train with million of labels, million labels, uh, you get much better performance, but if you do the self-supervised learning, you, you know, you do better than random, still less than the label case. Yes? If you did the trick that you mentioned before, denoising autoencoder. Yeah, 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 we're going to, uh, I want to get there, yeah. <laughs> uh, we are still with this cat, yes. <laughs> okay, let's move on. I think we <laughs> devoted enough time to this cat. Okay, so one thing that's important, um, when you train these uh, auxiliary tasks, network, this is something that you need to know. Networks or, or models, they try to cheat, right? They will do anything to succeed. They are really, they have no moral, right? They will just cheat. They will find, they, they try to trick you. So one thing they can do, they can just ignore the, the, the relative position. They can learn something just uh, about the statistics of the, of the patch. Uh, because usually if you look at high uh, texture patches, um, what they show here is that they collected a lot of high, high texture patches and they show the distribution, how they look across images. And they tend to be at the bottom. I'm not sure why they are here at the left. It probably should be more uniform. But they tend to be at the bottom. So network could just look at the patches and say, oh, this is high texture. I, I guess it's, it's at the bottom. <laughs> so, the yeah. Oh, it could be. Uh, yeah, but maybe left people. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's actually a lot of studies about this, about, yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. Um, here's another, another way that a network can cheat. Um, what do you think, I mean, the, when you see these two, the network can just look at the, at, the, at the borders, right? Can just look at the edge and see, oh, these two, this doesn't match. But if you look at this edge and that edge, oh, there's a perfect match. Then. I don't need to really understand the structure of the image and if it's the left ear of a uh, presumably cat. I can just, you know, do dot, uh, dot product of this edge and that edge. So network could cheat. They can perform well in the auxiliary task without learning what you want to learn. So you try to, you know, avoid this cheating. What they did was they, were, they took some, some gap between the patch and the nearby patches. They jittered them a bit, so they tried to reduce all these effects. And this was important, so it does learn the semantic representation. Uh, okay, other ideas. So this was one task with the patches. I think it's, I think it's cool. Uh, there are more other things you can imagine. Uh, for example, given an image, I, so you take an image, you hide the colors, and you ask the, your, your network to guess the, col the colors, right? So you train it, the input is black and white images, the output is colored images, and you train your network to produce the right, the right colors. Um, what's here? Again, this is, yes, uh, black and white to colored. Uh, oh, th they're all black and white and colored. Uh, yeah, and, and I mean, you, um, if I, Imagine I would ask you, I would give you this task, right? Let's say I give you this image and I ask you like, you know, like children book, co color this image. Well, maybe you, you put red, 
the, how do you call this in, in English? Who knows? A carbolet. How do you say carbolet in English? Who knows? Yeah, it, it doesn't exist. Okay, so, yeah. So, you see there is some semantic understanding. We know that this part of the, of the chicken is red, right? Uh, and, and dogs tend to be brown and the background's green, not vice versa. Okay. Uh, so this is predicting colors. Um, here, so you didn't uh, study yet a lot about deep learning, but the te technique is very similar. You take, um, you take the image and you just map it through a very complicated function and the output is going to be the same dimension as the input. This is very similar like the denoising autoencoder. Uh, okay, other, other tasks. Um, the, this task is uh, you take an image and you just crop part of the image and you require the network to label which, which animal this is. And you know the label of the original image. Um, so you get, you kind of, this is more like data augmentation. Um, anyways, uh, here's another which is surprisingly <laughs> tricky. Um, you take a photo and you, ro you use all four rotations and you ask the network to predict which is the right, you know, that, like the original rotation. It's not, it's not very, I mean, you would know this is wrong, but maybe, I mean, it's hard to tell sometimes, right? It turns out that the network learns something about the semantics of, I don't know, uh, birds stand on top of trees and not at the bottom. So there is some uh, learning, uh, uh, semantic deep learning happening there. Okay. Uh, so here's what happens. Uh, I think this is a, <clears throat> they used all these self-supervised tasks together, right? So relative position gave you that and the coloring, blah, blah, blah. And when, when you do all of them together, this brought them the uh, classification accuracy to 68. This is when you use the full label uh, problem. So all these self-supervised learning, they, you know, they bring you close, but this was still not as good as having complete label data set, right? And this was the detection problem we talked about, okay? Questions about this? Yes. Uh, so are we talking about transfer learning here where we train? No transfer learning. No. So what did we do with transfer, transfer learning? Uh, well, sorry. It, it, I mean, the term transfer uh, is used in different ways. Uh, what I meant is, oh, and, and now getting back to, there was another question about transfer learning. Sometimes people uh, refer to transfer learning in the following way you have a model, let's say a deep network, that you train on some classes, and then you take a representation, and then you use that representation, you, f you throw away the other classes that you trained on, you train with labeled data on these classes, right? And then you use this representation for new classes. For example, you have a data set with a camel, cat, car, and chair, and you train your network, you have a representation, and now you use this pre-trained representation, and now you train, you initialize your network, and now you train to discriminate between tables, cats, dragons, and whatever. Okay, so often when people say transfer learning, they, they mean this. Sometimes transfer learning is used more generally to just say, well, I trained on one task, and I'm using the representation to another task. Right, and my weights are not random. Right? Yeah, so pre-training, on one task using that representation, th this set of weights or the parameters of the model on new tasks. Uh, I mean, in general, people call it transfer learning. So in that sense, yeah, this is exactly transfer learning. But the point is that the tasks that you train <coughs> originally, the original ones, are not, did not require label data because you invented the labels in it. Okay? So, yeah, some of the term, they, they are used, used loosely. Um, okay. Uh, other, so, uh, we mentioned uh, denoising autoencoders. Uh, other, so, there are other tasks, right? Uh, here, you have two patches. You can ask, did they come from the same image or not? I think this is related to one of the questions here. 
uh, you can also you can do shuffling. You can take the the image and kind of you know shuffle different ones, and you ask the network to to sort the puzzle. Uh, you can try and fill uh, a mask. This is a bit like the noise, uh, the noising autoencoders. Uh, there's this mask, and you need to fill in the missing parts. So you can see, uh, you can be very inventive about what type of auxiliary tasks. And uh, you can see there are a lot of papers uh, doing this. And uh, I think one last I want to mention, this was uh, from last year. Uh, contrastive predicting coding. This is a, this is a rather complicated self-supervised um, learning task. I'm not going to go over all the details, but basically you, you, you decode each patch and you try to recreate a patch from, sorry, you, you try to recreate a patch from all the previous patches. So there's like uh, reconstruction inside the, the image. And then there are a lot of details here. The, the important point is that these results are actually, they, 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 um, that's a new level. So let me explain this. Um, what they did here is they run this, uh, they call it semi-supervised. It's, it's self-supervised with these techniques. And I'm showing you here the top five accuracy in uh, object classification. So top five accuracy means um, you're given an image and the network guesses cat, dog, camel, and, and you just among the five top guesses, you say it, it, it's correct if at least one of these five was, was correct, okay? So you kind of allow the network five guesses. And this is one of the common metrics. And the point now is that um, uh, this is with pre-training and this is using uh, the red one is fully supervised. So what happens here is that the blue one does this self-supervised and then post training with a small number of labels. And, and this guy used the same number of labels but uh, um, without this uh, self-supervision. And what you see here is that you really get a significant improvement for a, a large range even with hundreds of samples, it's still better to do pre-training with this technique. So that, that's actually, that's, that's interesting, right? Because it tells you using this self-supervision is actually useful not only when you don't have sample, label samples or, or just when you have few labels. Even when you have hundreds of labels, this, this can still be useful. And, and the self-supervised part is the CPC part? Yeah, it's this guy. This representation learning. And the type of self-supervised task is kind of a hyperparameter in a sense? Like you, just, you try a different one? Well, well, here, it, this is just for that one. What people did before, they just, they just do all of them, and they try to combine the representation somehow. There is no, we don't have a very good theory. I don't think we don't have any theory of how to select uh, self, you know, these auxiliary tasks and how to combine them, we, we don't have, we don't know yet how to do that. And especially, all these results are for images, for other types of data, uh, some you know, for some types of data like 3D perception, there are no, still no good uh, sub-supervision tests. Okay. Um, I think the take home messages here, uh, there are many self-supervised tasks for images. Uh, it's closing the gap with strong supervision. I think that's, that's surprising. Um, okay. A uh, few other examples with uh, video. Just to give intuition, in, in, video, in video, the problem is, I mean, the natural thing would be, let's predict the next frame. That, that's the first thing everyone thinks about, right? You have a lot of frames. Oh, let's predict the next frame. The problem is that Usually next frames in videos, they're just too similar. So you don't get enough, um, enough feedback. Well, then you say, let's predict the uh, 10th frame. The problem is that in videos, it's, it's like continuous time. Sometimes too much happens, and then you just, it, it's too different. And sometimes nothing happens. So it turns out that just predicting a constant frame in the future, it doesn't work well. 
the, the other thing is that, and that's point number two, is that often it's actually really hard to predict the future. Uh, you know, predictions are hard, especially about the future. Imagine, um, here's the example I think that Tian does. Um, I, I'm doing this, and it's going to fall. Kind of imagine a blurred image where you have half marker here and half there. So it's actually, we don't have good uh, metrics to compare uh, different futures. So um, they had uh, several ideas to do self-supervised learning on video. By the way, just uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Uh, so one approach is you take a video and you play it forward or backward. And the network needs to decide, is this going the right direction, error of time or backwards? Um, you can imagine, right, you see the, the dripping faucet. You know that it doesn't go up, right? The water doesn't go up or, um, yeah, cars don't drive backwards, etc. So it, this, this does capture some structure. Um, uh, this is an, an interesting example. Uh, what they did was they take sequence of frames and they select three frames and the classifier needs to decide are the three frames in the right order or not. Uh, unless you're a baseball fan, uh, I mean this is hard for me even, but uh, you know here there's this uh, throwing motion, right? He throws and then uh, stops and this this does, doesn't make sense right in terms of the standard actions um, and this could be useful for learning representations for example for action recognition and the point was that even here it's tr it's important to find those triplets that not just random triplets this is related to your question about what happens if you don't select the right patch, right? If you select a patch that is not interesting, then it's not going to be useful. In video, it turns out that a lot of the triplets of the frames are not useful. So they, they had to invest more uh, to find areas in, or periods in the video that had high motion and only uh, sample from, from these uh, video segments. Uh, this is the same, they just passed them through the same network and they do the same as we did before. And this uh, help with uh, action recognition tasks. Action recognition, you show a video and you need to decide is, this, is it throwing, is it playing, I don't know, tennis, right? So uh, using the self-supervised learning did help here actually uh, quite a lot, right? Again, not, not all the way. It improved like by 12%, but there's still 17 to go. Um, Okay, I, I think you got the idea, right? Um, and of course, one of the, the key question is how do, you, how do you define these tasks? Uh, what would be a good task? So you have a task you care about, then you make up all these auxiliary tasks. What would be a good task for, for the, the one you care about? And we don't have a necessarily good, good way to do that. Still need some creativity. So um, I want to... I wanna, spend a few more minutes about self-supervised learning for text because this was uh, very successful this year. Uh, and let me remind, um, how many of you learned about, you, you learned about word to vec uh, Was this in one of your classes or? No, 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 but some people know about it, yeah. Okay, um, so one of the points is that vision and, 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 and language they are, they're very different in terms of the, the signals because um, in vision, if you take a small bit of an image, it ha you know, there, there are a lot of, it's a continuous signal, uh, there are a lot of pixels, and every pixel, you know, if you kill a pixel, it doesn't uh, make a big difference, right? But in sentences, if you hide one word or two words, then the whole meaning might, might change, right? Or if you do a manipulation, I don't know, you switch subject and object, uh, you know, man, uh, bite, dog, um, things, I mean, the whole meaning can change really drastically if you make these apparently small uh, changes. So there's this question of can you really uh, distort uh, text in a way that, that can still be learned. Um, so in a way, um, so that, that's part of the, the modeling uncertainty uh, is easy, but optimization is hard. Okay. Uh, 
Let me describe quickly something that's called word to vec, um, and then the idea of self, they're both under the umbrella of self-supervised learning. Um, are, are they going to learn this uh, next uh, question? Do you, do you know how they? Um, what's what's that? There is an election course. Election course. Um, so so let me let me spend few few minutes about this. This is still that that's useful. So uh, someone asked me during uh, the break. Um, a lot of the techniques that we describe to you are for, uh, you know, vectors that are in Euclidean spaces. They're, they're numbers, right? Um, they are vectors in RD, and you can measure distances, and they're all continuous. And this is a good representation for, let's say, analog signals, for images, for sound, maybe scientific measurements. But some types of data, you have categorical variables, like, like text, right? Every word could be one of a large, uh, you know, a large vocabulary of possible words, let's say 80,000. So how would you represent that? One approach would be every word is just, you have a vector of 80, 100,000 possible words, everyone's zero except one that is one, right? You say, oh, this is the word number 705 in the dictionary. But, but then these vectors, you know, they're all zeros and just one, they call one hot vector, right? Because they're one and all zeros. They are really hard to work with. You cannot really compute distances between them because if you compute dot product, uh, they're going, it's going to be zero most of the time. Um, even if you, so um, one thing that people do is they try to map words to a low dimensional Euclidean space. That means, imagine you have this two dimensional space and you just say, I'm going to pick a position for every word. I'm going to put words on this, uh, two-dimensional space, and I'm going to do it in a way that similar words are going to be in the same area. So the more, more related words are going to be in one side, I, you know, maybe animals here and cars here and politics there. And so that's the goal of something that's called word embedding. Again, the goal is to take a categorical variables and represent them in Euclidean space. Take word, you map it to somewhere in a Euclidean space. And here's an example, um, right? This is the politics area. I don't know, election, country, partisan struggle. This is, uh, I'm not sure what this is. <laughs> um, administration, conservation. This is part of a larger, em embedding of a larger uh, vocabulary. So how, one way to do that, uh, called word to vec. The idea is that if you see a sentence, you can often guess the content of a missing word by the context. Uh, what do you think this is? Uh, all of a sudden, a cat jumped off a tree to chase a mouse. Other options, not a cat. Well, it could be a cat or a kitty, a uh, fox. So, I mean, but there, there's like a small number of things that would make sense here, right? And the point is that all these should be embedded nearby because they kind of fit the same context. So. The idea is that you take an input vector, like a one hot vector that I described to you, and you, um, you map it in a linear way to a hidden layer, and you try to predict the words nearby. Let me just say there are two ways to do it. You can predict the missing words from the context, or you can predict the context from the missing words. Uh, and people do both, uh, but the point is that the, by trying to predict the context, you learn some representation, and this would be the Euclidean embedding. I know I did it very fast, and in your lecture course, you're going to study about word to vec. But the point is that um, we kind of play the same trick. Uh, we kind of hide the word, and you tr we try to predict it using the context, and from that, we take uh, representation. By the way, word to vec, there were all these uh, interesting properties of the representation. Uh, if you see this, this semantic algebra, I'll skip that uh, here. Okay. Um, so, so one thing that, uh, one uh, grave limitation of word to vec is that once you learn the presentation of a word, you learn it using the context. But once you learned it, it is fixed for that word. So if you learn a representation of the word bank, this is always the example they give, 
bank, it will be the same representation if, either if this is a bank where you put the money in or if this is the river bank. So it, you'd have the same representation per word, not per sentence. And now what people try to do is to uh, create a representation of a, of a, of a word given, given the context of the full sentence. So the, um, I mean, you still didn't, didn't learn about uh, sequence models, so I'm gonna skip some of that. But uh, the idea is that you have a sentence and you have these small models here, and uh, each one of these boxes takes a representation um, and then maps it to another representation, maps it to another representation, and each one of them depends on all the others. And I'm going about this very briefly because uh, once you study about deep learning, it's gonna make more sense. But the idea is that, again, you learn a series of representations, and each one of them depends on all the others in the sentence. Basically, like this, there's something called attention, for those of you uh, that know about it. Uh, and it turns out that these models, and I think the first uh, big success with this model was called BERT, uh, which is bidirectional transformers. Uh, and it, uh, was improving uh, by far on this uh, language, general language understanding uh, benchmark with 11 language tasks. Uh, and since then, there are, you know, there are several approaches here and since BERT there were more and more. Uh, BERT was for the first time used uh, in an impressive way in a task of generating sentences. You've all seen GANs, right? Where you generate images, faces. Uh, and for a long time, people said it's really, really hard to do with text. We did not have a good automated way to generate text that looked natural. And, and these models were the first that were doing that. Um, this is uh, from OpenAI, a model called GPT-2. At some point they said, um, I think they said this is a uh, such a dangerous technology that can be used for fake news that they didn't want to, did not want to release the model, but then at some point they released it. So uh, here the, the point is there's, um, there's like a, a sentence and then the system completes the sentence with, with uh, right, it adds a few more paragraphs. I think it's a cool example. Uh, the, the original paragraph was in a shocking finding scientists cover a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Uh, even more surprising to the researcher was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English, okay? So that's what you feed the network, and then you ask the network to add more sentences to it, and these are several alternatives. Uh, the scientists named the population after their distinctive horns, uh, whatever, Ovid unicorns, these four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. So, <laughs> I mean, this is, this, I mean, this, uh, this is nonsensical, right? But it is well-formed language, and I don't know, maybe flat earthers are gonna, you know, you can believe that. Um, <laughs> people believe many kind of things. Um, there are other, um, some funny, uh, there, there's one that I liked here. It was particularly funny. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, okay, um, maybe it's not here. So th the point is that uh, it appears that these techniques can suddenly create sentences that um, to the you know, naked eye seem as if someone, uh, a person uh, could have written them. Uh, now it, it should be taken with a grain of salt, of course, that if you, um, if you try to push harder these models, they would do silly things. Uh, if you, so uh, Gary Marcus had this new data set where he asks these systems to complete a word, but he, he designed uh, continuations, like completions that require you to understand something about the world. Like if you take a banana and put it in the freezer and you take it out and you eat it, you would feel, I, I mean, then you need to know what happens in the freezer, right? There's, there's physics, there's knowledge. And of course these systems, 
it's very hard for them, right? They don't really have a deep understanding of, of the world. They basically learn the statistics of, of sequences of words, and this is not the same, right? Um, so clearly, these, there's a big debate if these systems are intelligent or imitate intelligence. This is kind of a shallow uh, intelligence, if you wish, right? There's no deeper understanding of the physical mechanisms underlying unicorns, if you wish. Um, so I think this is what I wanted to say about, um, about self-supervised learning. Uh, I think that there's a lot of effort in this uh, field and um, it's probably going to be more interesting in the coming few years. Any more questions? <coughs> Were there other questions that I well before and I didn't answer? Yes. Yeah. Why don't we just try to somehow create a network that learns specifically representation? Why do we need the auxiliary tasks? Well, what would be your loss? Oh, so, so l let me say that. Uh, sorry, b your original question was, what if I have information about what, let's say, patches should be similar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have that information, that's great. You can use that to learn a good representation. And, and in a way, what word to vec what, what is an uh, embedding approach, is that's exactly what they do. They learn a representation where someone tells you, oh, these two should be similar. Um, and uh, this is a very common approach. Uh, and, and it is used, for, for example, also for image embedding, for multimodal. Yeah. It's, uh, and also, these similar, in a way, these similarity feedback labels sometimes are easier to get. So sometimes, like if I show you a, a complex scene and I'm asking you to give this a label, sometimes it's hard. What, what, what's the right way to describe this? But on the other hand, if I'm showing you uh, an image and I'm showing you these two alternatives and I ask you which one is similar uh, to the original one, sometimes it's easier. And so these these triplet losses are often very useful. It's easier to collect data and it's easier to, to optimize with. Um, yes? So maybe this is a real, irrelevant question in this day and age. A lot of these uh, examples, all these examples, uh, uh, heavily involve the deep learning. Yep. Uh, are there also examples of this kind of technique for uh, like outside, like for other, uh, is the idea of self supervised learning relevant to other types of? Yeah. So, so so the reason this is heavily biased towards deep learning is that deep learning are models where you have many, many parameters, and you often need a lot of data to tune them. This is why you're trying to use these auxiliary tasks to gain a lot of made-up labels. So it, it is most helpful with models that have a lot of parameters. If you have a small number of parameters, then often you just collect a small label data set, and that might be enough. Yeah. Like a lot of vocabulary data and stuff like that. And maybe the deep learning solutions are not. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good So um, th that's a good point. And it's possible that you <coughs> may also want to learn the representation in a deep way, but then on top of that, you could apply other things. There is room for more ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that that's n definitely not the the last yeah. word. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I think there is uh, uh, there is pedagogical sense to, to keep uh, teaching it and uh, so, show what it's uh, yeah. how it's from from person from as they started that lecture. So, so okay, I have, I have an answer for you. But before I, before I give the answer, I want to say something about the horizon of 10 years, okay? I saw this uh, survey a few years ago. I think New York Times did it or something. They asked people about the future. Uh, what would happen and when? And you could see that things cluster into two time horizons. People would either predict something in the next two years or like 50 years, which means Either you know something is in the baking and you say, oh, this will mature in two years, or 
I have no idea. I'm just saying something about 50 years. So 10 years is a really, really hard horizon to predict. Um, I can tell you the, the trends that are you know, being in the making now and I think are really important. And um, one of the strongest assumptions that we did with supervised learning was that the test data has the same distribution as the training data. So this is all theory of supervised learning. We basically learn to predict samples that come from the same distribution that we've seen. But one thing uh, that we as people do, so we know it's possible, we generalize much farther. So our machines can generalize to new instances of things that we've seen before, and they're really poor in generalizing to new classes, new distributions, and there's a lot of work to, to generalize better. For example, uh, you talk about transfer learning. This is one type of stronger generalization. You generalize to new classes. Uh, in a way, when we, often when we talk about generalization, you, see, sam you know, see samples of cats and dogs, and you want to generalize to new samples of cats and dogs. But perhaps you see in cats and dogs and camels and cars, and you want to generalize to new classes. One, um, and it appears that for people, we can generalize with very few, few samples. And one of the reasons we do that is we have some like mechanistic understanding. Um, we make predictions often not just because we see the statistical correlations, but because we understand why things happen. We have a, we have a model, right? If I'm showing you, you know, I'm, I'm gonna show, if there was something here and I would kick it, even if you've never seen that object, you, you would understand how it would you know, roll in, in the room because you have some kind of a model of the physics, right? So it's, it's not just about the statistics of, of data. Just a second. So one um, direction that is very important is the idea of moving away from correlation-based learning to causal-based learning. And just to explain uh, as an example, imagine that you train a classifier to tell I don't know, uh, cats from camels, okay? And cats, uh, you know their background, their typical background are these couches. They're always on a couch. And camels are in the desert. So if you see uh, a desert in the background, this is a very strong predictor of a camel. And if you train deep networks on, on such data, then it's very likely that if you put a cat in a desert, it would say, it would say camel because it is the, the, the background is really a strong predictor. It's, it's, a, it's a good predictor, it usually helps, but we know that it, it has nothing to do with a camel. This is just a, a correlation. So there's a lot of effort to try to disentangle these correlations from what actually is the, is the, you know, the mechanism, what, what is essentially uh, predicting a camel, not just the background. And I should say, this is also important, uh, maybe you talked about uh, issues of biases in supervised learning. Did, did you talk about this? Uh, yeah, what was that? No, not, much. No, not yet, but, but perhaps you heard about it. There's a, there's a lot of discussions about this. Um, I mean, in terms of how, how learning affects society, imagine that uh, so now you're going to put a uh, deep network to make decisions instead of people. For example, you can predict if a, if a, you know, a, a seal in a, in a prison is going to make a crime again or not. And this is actually a plot. I mean, someone actually took a deep network to predict if someone should be released or not based on a deep network, which is, it doesn't make you feel well um, because these networks are really uh, sensitive to these correlations and not to, to, uh, to the mechanism. So there's a question if we can build uh, models that capture the right cause, they would be more fair they would be, you make the correct decision and they will also perform better. So I think this, this direction of mechanism-based or causal-based, I hope that we're gonna have a large progress in the next few years. Yes? You said that you compared the neural networks to, to our brain. I don't think it's a fair comparison to say that neural networks can generalize like our brain. We are trained on multiple and multiple tasking carries this since the moment you are born. And then you are asking if a neural net can generalize from uh, predicting cars to predicting cars just by, but it's, it's not comparable. I, I agree. I am um, 
I'm not claiming that neural networks are like neural networks. I actually have a talk like this. The, but my point was that we know that um, generalizing or learning with fewer sample, it seems possible we, because we know uh, of or, that organisms like, like people do, they do generalize much better than our current uh, architectures. I'm not saying that our current architectures are parallels of brains. I'm just saying that there is room for improvement. We have hope to improve there because we know we, we, it seems like it's possible. Thank you so much. <laughs>